Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for attending our presentation today. Um, just wanted to uh, say hello. I know a few of you actually missed us last week and uh, we, we just got a little inundated with a bunch of work. So we thought we'd take a break for a week and send you our other webinars. Hopefully you had the opportunity to see those other two webinars last week while we took the week to just do work. So um, thanks for joining us and thanks for having the patience to uh, again watch another session. Um, when we did our surveys, and we really appreciate all of our clients who always give us great topics and great surveys, um, great responses to our surveys on what they'd like to see, this was actually the last topic in our survey that everybody wanted to see. So um, again, we're going to be continuing that on, and today's talking about burn rate. And since we also have a couple of company owners on here, um, certainly, obviously, you know, I'm going to sway that both to personal and business because I think that will add a new dynamic to this that's obviously super important. Um, and uh, just a really important topic for sure that we deal with every day. Oh, sorry about that. My apologies. And obviously not to just pick on the women. We'll now show you her husband. Yes, this is my home office. My crib, the inner sanctum, the brain. <laughs> oh, I'm really productive here. I just think you have a lot of toys. I got a lot of toys. I certainly do. Oh. Say hello to my little friend. Have you seen this club? Hello, gorgeous. This club, this man of war, is solid titanium with a holocore magnesium shaft. I don't even know what that means. All I know is this is the club paid $975. Oh, tax. <laughs> but don't tell Penny. Told her I got it on the internet used for $375. Not that she's going to complain. Please, not after her affair with her jimmies. What do you do with that many shoes? What do you do with that many shoes? You only got two feet. Anyway, enough about me. Did you see this? Wow, yes. That is a work of art. This is 69 inches of HD LCD surround sound glory, easily paid off by 2010. So reached success. I love it. I haven't really figured out this remote. Get on you. Oh. Uh, no. Well, you 
the one. I like this station. Golf is an exception. So why we show these videos is because you, you wouldn't believe that we probably see this more often than not. And why we wanted to try to continue this and kind of tell people about what is burn rate? What's the importance of this? We actually deal with denialers probably 40 to 60% of the time. So if people actually believe that you know, this doesn't happen. It certainly does happen. And it certainly, you know, at, at some point in time, sometimes people are that and sometimes people are that some of the time. So maybe what we'll do is start our first poll. So let me launch our first poll here. And you guys can be part of this. Okay, we've only got 8% that's voted. So can we get the rest of the crowd voting here and we can uh, get this closed up right away. We've got 40% of the people who have voted. We're gonna get a couple more who vote here out of the group. We've got some uh, closet denialers apparently that don't wanna fill out this questionnaire. <laughs> okay. We're at 42% not moving. So either the rest of you are falling asleep from those videos or just don't want to actually answer this question. So I guess what we'll do is we'll close the poll here. So half of the half of the place voted and let me share the results with you. So out of half of it, so maybe the people who are the other yeses don't want to admit that they actually are that person or some of the time, doesn't everybody have a denialer at some point in time in their lives? Um, so that's the biggest thing is, is you know, 100% of the people who voted said, no, they've never been that person. So that's fantastic. Um, when I would, I would suggest, Pam, that because we, we take in clients based on a similar values fit, <clears throat> that I'm not necessarily surprised that our, our people and maybe our attendees are really aware of their conscious spending. Because it could be the case that the people that deny that they might have um, a spending problem incongruent with their saving strategy might not know that they're in denial. So for us, it really doesn't matter if you live a low lifestyle or medium or high lifestyle. <clears throat> we all have luxuries in certain areas of our life. It's what we believe is that it comes down to conscious spending, hence this whole topic of, of knowing your burn rate. Awesome. Um, and then I guess a couple of you had just, I just got a message that the poll wasn't working for a couple of you if you were on iPads or cell phones, maybe that's what happened there. Um, so what is burn rate? People often ask us, what is burn rate? So whether you have um, a company or your personal, your burn rate really is the money that you make after tax personally um, and what you actually spend for today and tomorrow's lifestyle, that actually, the, the sum of that is your actual burn rate at the end of the day. So it's about conscious spending so that you have what your after-tax income is. And many people I've heard, you know, well, I make $2 million. Well, you might make $2 million inside your company. You personally do not make, you know, $2 million personally. So you always want to differentiate between what you actually make corporately to what you actually 
take home personally. And, you know, sometimes people go, well, I just take whatever I need and they pay themselves dividends or they pay themselves whatever. If you're not an employee, those who are an employee, you actually take home an after-tax amount of income. And knowing that after-tax amount of income you take, whether you're an employee or whether or not you own a company, you need to know what is that after-tax number that comes into your bank account every single month. And a lot of corporate people go, well, I don't pay payroll, I just take a dividend and I put it in my bank account. Well, what is that dividend costing you at the end of the day? A lot of people are shocked when all of a sudden you've taken a $200,000 dividend that then becomes, hey, you know what, you now have to pay a 49% tax rate on. So calculate that dividend after your tax rate so that you know really what you are taking home so that you're not shocked at that tax bill at the end of the day. And another way to think about it is, is what is your savings rate or what percentage? Like, it's interesting to kind of treat that almost like as a fun game. So we'll, we'll kind of walk through that coming up. So, you know, oftentimes we hear the, com the comment from people is, you know, I don't have enough money to have a financial planner or, hey, you know, I, I don't make enough money to ever get rich. I can never be like them. And I always disagree with people because I'm like, you know, no matter how you grew up or no matter what you did, everyone makes enough money to be rich. And rich depends on your own goals. Rich depends on what you want out of life. Rich depends on um, where you are at instead of, you know, really looking at, well, can I be rich like him? Well, he might be in a completely different situation than you. But I would often say a lot of times people who have a lot of money, you know, that that old age thing of, you know, you make more, you spend more, that definitely happens. And I've seen that even with our client bases, that definitely does happen. So really being rich is more about what you keep in your pocket. It's about the basics. It's about, you know, that more than anything else, you know, is, is it the basics. And I always go back to one of our clients that we had, and he uh, passed away a few years back. and. Um, but he had multiple oil companies, multiple engineering firms, and I always laughed because people would meet him and even he'd come to our office and he'd have a ripped t-shirt on, ripped jeans. He lived in the same house that he built in 1970, didn't really want to upgrade it and kept a lot of his money. So that's why he had a lot of dough. He had multiple houses, places, he had a boat, he had things that he really enjoyed doing and going. And people were like, wow, but he didn't have a lot of stuff otherwise. And so he wasn't, you know, living a lavish lifestyle other than, yes, he did have a few properties and he did go to places that he really liked, but he would spend on those properties just enough. He didn't have to have, you know, the latest, greatest of everything. And he tended to have a ton of money from it. And, um, you know, that's where it kind of comes down to him and his wife were not people that you know, spent a ton of money, had the latest purses. So, and he was always really, really, really targeted on what is my after-tax income? What am I actually taking home? Because he didn't care as much of, you know, we'd always calculate a burn rate as well for his company side to say, how much is his company making versus what is his expenses? And that's really important as a company to kind of know what is your burn rate on your company too? So that if in fact you're running into an issue like the economy right now, um you you're not afraid you know what your burn rate is on your company you know what the burn rate is on your own personal life that you can actually make it through this and that's why we often talk you want to have emergency funds not only for your company we often say three to five months income you always want to keep personally um so that you have that from a company perspective as well as having that from a personal perspective always and now people you know with COVID are now going oh you know now I get that emergency fund I, I'm so happy that you know I've done that I'm so happy I listened I'm so happy I heard that because you know you see how important that becomes when that can be an emergency or opportunity fund so a lot of people are putting that to work as opportunities because your example with this individual that was wealthy with a number of dollars they had but didn't appear outwardly to have that you know, I would argue that they there's other more successful examples even in our client list 
where they're they've got more purpose to their funds they they're allocating it and sharing it if that's what means something to them but that individual did almost too good a job to um, know the burn rate maybe minimize spending and then there wasn't much of a purpose when the money transitioned elsewhere um, so it's 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 about family dialogue it's about what are the numbers and what what is the lifestyle that you choose and that could be very luxurious in certain areas we have people that have a very small home and don't upgrade it and then have crazy uh, travel budgets and, and see the world and they're rich in experience. The opposite can be said too. Um, you know, the, the house as a, as a castle and, and not traveling much or not having uh, many other luxuries and just kind of being house rich is, is very correct and right for some people that they just make the most of that and they're kind of homebodies. But um, what we're, our goal is, is to, is to maybe really focus uniquely on your household and help you apply this to you so that you are living the right lifestyle. And it's never about living minimum, but what we might get to in the future here is talking about minimally acceptable and having that knowledge, that awareness is really key and i think a lot of our people have that and i think we need to just elevate it uh going forward with our continued work and certainly we want to make this presentation as interactive as possible so if you have questions or you'd like to be part of this presentation just raise your hand or go to the question bar or the chat bar and enter in anything you want to know and we're going to make this part of the presentation today just that it makes it more interesting and kind of makes it more about you as well that you're attending this session and i think everyone always gets value off of everyone else out of our other presentations people have really gotten value off of the comments or things that they're doing so i wanted to make sure that everybody knows that you can do that at any time and we'll definitely include you on this for sure so the next one is, how do I really get to be wealthy? And, you know, that's a question we get asked, especially from young kids right now is, you know, how, how can I do this? How can I be more like mom and dad? Or how can I be more like these movie stars or hockey guys? And, um, you know, it's more about the basics than you know. You know, I grew up with, you know, knowing Theron and knowing Gary Roberts. And most people didn't know that Gary Roberts was almost bankrupt when he left the city. And I think at the end of the day, um, you know, and Theron had a rough life, as many of you know, too. It's, it's kind of more about the basics than you know. And when you spend a lot of money or you have a family that doesn't communicate well and you just spend a lot of money, you really don't get to be where you want to go. And I, I really go back to, you know, the way I grew up is you always needed to have goals. And especially with kids, um, it's about the habits that you hold and it's about what you do. You know, my parents were always entrepreneurs. You know, my mom worked for my dad as a bookkeeper and my dad owned multiple service stations. And he had an accounting degree and decided to go be an entrepreneur. And I kind of talk about having a business or whether you're an employee, you, you really develop different habits in your life as to what you have, what you don't have. My parents were always fairly frugal on money, but you know, we didn't do without as kids. And I think, you know, looking back, there was a lot of great things, which, you know, we'll talk about kids later in this presentation, but there's a lot of great things that you can pass down to your kids that then your kids will have better financial habits as well. And I think that's really about um, the habits you hold at the end of the day. People often say, well, you know, how, how much do you have to work to do that? I don't really want to work. I just want to go have fun. I really don't want to do anything. I just want to go do this or go do that all day long. And so I always say it's how how hard or how long, because if you don't want to work hard, you might have to work a ton longer in your life to get where you want to be. And that's okay too. If that's the choice, you kind of choose more personal life against business. But that's the difference between I really feel like somebody who's extremely wealthy and someone who's not is they dedicate their life to some of this and they make a lot of money doing it, but they tend not to let down on the reins. And so that's, again, where you look at a lot of this. Resiliency is another big one. You know, COVID has taught us all about resiliency is you obviously have to make it as far as you can through um, anything that you're going through when that could be a divorce that could be a death that could be grief that could be health issues in your life um, many different things 
And so having resiliency and, and being tough through that is part of actually the ability to be wealthy. Um, taking a 30 day challenge. So we're gonna talk more about that. Um, that's something that Kelly and I do, and we can again talk about our own personal experiences with that that might really interest you guys is not only do we do financial planning, but we are both accountable to each other as well as, you know, I have a friend who's a personal banker, many of you have met her, Kat, um, who who actually is private wealth with TD. And I sit down with her and she even goes, okay, well, you gotta do this. And we, and so I think being accountable to people, doing a 30 day challenge, which Kelly and I do all the time, and we be accountable to other people as well as ourselves is saying, and to each other is saying, you know, what actually do we spend? Write down every single thing that we spend every single month. And, you know, it was an even eye opener for us as we would take the staff for lunch. So that was the big one that I kind of went, whoa, because we were always going out for lunch if we didn't have client meetings. And we often didn't bring our own lunch. And, you know, because we didn't know when our lunch was going to be, we'd have meetings, we'd do whatever. And, so we'd take clients for lunch and then we'd say to the staff, okay, you know, wow, you know, it's two o'clock or whatever. And we've got a client in the boardroom. They didn't want to have lunch. Let's just go get lunch because it's easier, quicker. And we spent a lot of money, like lots of money, like over a thousand dollars on taking the staff for lunch every month. So that was a bit shocking to both of us because it's like, we're just going along our merry way and, you know, buying lunch. And so, you know, it was kind of surprising to us is that, you know, we take work and we do work meetings with the staff and stuff like that. But, you know, we were like, if that's crazy, why are we not bringing our own sandwiches? Why are we not doing some things that could be more beneficial? And that's, again, taking that 30 day challenge, write it down, see how much you're spending at Starbucks. Kelly, yeah. you might have some ideas with that, too. And, and tracking that. It's very, very easy to slip into that mode that says, well, that's a lot of work. Why am I going to track that? Oh, and then I'm going to be judged. I need to reduce it. I need to minimize it. Oh, so people are going to see this and critique spending patterns. That is not why you track the actuals. Or, you know, it, the, the goal is to be aware of that conscious spending. In some instances, you might say, okay, I need to spend more in this area. Maybe I need like family day trips or more staycations or better cable or a new program or, you know, a golf membership or, you know, a membership to one of the, the clubs or the Calgary Winter Club. Like maybe it can be, I need to spend more. But the goal is to just be aware and conscious of that spending. So for us, we dialed back the um, team lunches uh, to half of those had a bit of a challenge to say, okay, let's bring our lunches. And then we reallocated that budget to maybe do a bit of more of a, a team retreat every six months. So it's really key to, to really focus on that, right? Same thing when you come back to your own spend levels. Um, it's not about tracking the actuals so that you need to live underneath a budget. So there's this really common, um, perspective and mindset and that's what this is all about it's not just about habits it's about your perspective and we can share different mindsets and we can be that sounding board for you um, a lot of times that happens a little bit in the household but you need someone objective outside of that household too so that um, we can help you say okay well if we're going to do this renovation or this travel or this Maybe we can't have this, or we need to work an extra year, for example, if there's a big kitchen reno. So it, we can help you with the trade-offs. So if this, then that. So that's a lot of what this is about too, Pam, is about mindsets. And it's really key to say, okay, I need to track actuals, because that is the only way, if you know your, your foundation of your lifestyle spending, that's the only way that we can forecast for you to say, yes, you have enough. Yes, you can stop work or you can make work optional. Um, maybe you can change a job or you know, get into a different career. We need that foundation of lifestyle level. You can have different lifestyle levels throughout your life. Maybe if the kids leave or if the kids are in the house, um, just depends, but all of that is the case. So we'll launch the next poll here. 
and hopefully everybody can see it. And you can all vote on it. Perfect. We have almost 55% voted. So maybe the same people can't vote or we'll wait a couple more minutes. Oh, now we're at 65% voted. So we're getting uh, quite a few people here. Okay, we're now at 70%. Leave it open for another minute here. A couple seconds anyway. Okay, we're still at 70%. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll here at 70%. So here we'll share the results. So 78% said they calculate this on their own, which is fantastic if you're doing that every month and you're, or at least doing the 30 day challenge where you really sit down and, and calculate, what am I really spending? What am I doing on it? Um, but you know, it's funny because the other 22% said this just gives them hives to think about. So we don't have anybody in the middle here. <laughs> and, and out of the group here, they no one sends it to us. So again, that's something that we can kind of talk about because part of our models and what we do for, for our fee models um, is we have people who actually send us their budget monthly. And Jeff will actually calculate it for you monthly. We have some people who say, you know what, I don't want to just do a 30 day challenge. I want to do a six month challenge. We often, for people who are entering their retirement plans, um, we often try to then say, um, you know what, we're going to do six months. And for some people who are really all over the map, and when we say all over the map is some people will spend, you know, we've seen in our practice, um, a lot of people will spend four thousand dollars in a month and then all of a sudden the next month's ten the next month's six the next month's th about thirty eight hundred bucks um the next one's twelve and then they're like yeah but we had a trip in there yeah but we had this in here and yeah but and you get a lot of yeah buts but you want to get some consistency over the year to say what is that travel amount what is what are those things that are adding in um and like this last slide says is like lump sums. So we often say, and of course I always grew up with that habit because my parents made me do it. Um, my tax return and my parents always have said that. And it's funny because I now say it to Kelly all the time when we get money back from the government or we get a check back for payroll or something like that. It's like, or they give government, you know, surpluses and, and things like COVID stuff right now. My parents have always said, that's not your money government money is never your money you can never have that money it's not yours and so i always grew up with if i got a tax return when i was young it went towards paying debt and if i didn't have any debt my parents would then make me go to the bank and go put it into a savings account or buy a gic for school and i hated it i hated it as a young kid and it was funny because as i grew up every time i got a tax return i put that on my mortgage and I did that consistently every single year and put it on my mortgage. And so then it's like same to this date. If we get it in our corporation, my dad always laughed and said, well, you know, honey, now you got a business, you know, that's not your money. And you'll get that money back from the government. But you know what? The next year you're going to pay it back to the government. So you need to keep all of that money. So if we ever get any money back, we always keep it in a side account. And I squirrel it away. And Kelly sometimes laughs at me because it's like the day later I squirreled it away. And I'm like, no, this is our savings money to pay the government. So, you know, that's, that's something that you just grow up with and that's what you you need to do so I would always say like if you're an employee or you are a company owner and you get a tax return put that mortgage against your debt so if you have any kind of debt at all you pay it immediately towards your debt yeah and I think Pam so you're saying if you get like a tax refund apply to mortgage or any other debt or use it consciously for a lump sum of savings a lot of our clients don't have debt so then maybe you grab that tax refund and that uh, kickstarts your savings for this year and it's your RSP contribution for this year. Um, I'm glad on that poll that a few people said that, okay, this concept gives me hives to think about. 
because I hear that half of the time when this topic comes up. And I think that is irresponsible and we need to change how we think about it. Maybe that comes from preconceived notions or how we grew up. It's normal maybe to kind of get a bit of stress when you talk about things like money. But I would argue, I would suggest, I would coach people to think, to change their perspective. What if this whole goal is about maximizing the joy that you get from your spending. Okay, well, I think we can talk differently about that. Why don't we just go on like four or five or six shopping sprees in a year? Why don't we make gifts a shopping spree? Who's coming up in the next six months that we have to give a gift for? What about travel? That can be a shopping spree. So sometimes that conversation can be in the house saying, okay, well, what are we gonna do for like a weekend away or maybe a big trip? That's a shopping spree. If for, for stuff that doesn't happen every single month, maybe like clothes or uh, things for the house, you could make that a shopping spree. I know Pam, one of the big luxuries in your life is your, is your uh, backyard outdoor space and your garden. And you go on a shopping spree maybe twice a year where you just get so much joy from then from then spending on that stuff but the key is you know that number you know what you spent in that area and that's that's the whole goal well and that's that's what comes down to this 30-day challenge and i know a couple of you um on the question poll here have added you've used intuit so these are two that we use quite a bit. So ClarityMoney.com, if Intuit works, um, he said, I'm not an Intuit employee. Thanks, John, for that suggestion. Um, Clarity, Clarity Money has been a great one because it's free. Um, their app recently, they just changed, so now it doesn't work. That's one that I've used in the past. Um, a lot of clients have used that one. Um, it tends to be a really neat tool, and they don't do a lot of marketing around it. They don't do a lot of ad stuff, and they don't promote it in any way. So I kind of like that because it was actually even developed by a financial planner at one point. Um, so ClarityMoney.com is a great one to use. Um, Mint, some people use their banks. So some people's banks, like I know TD has started one, RBC has one, um, where they actually will track those expenses for you. Um, and put them into different categories and also be aware that you know with the, even the Intuit QuickBooks stuff um, when you download to these programs the programs like let's say you go to a restaurant and the restaurant isn't actually a restaurant it's travel for you it doesn't always put it in the right categories so oftentimes people give that to us as a budget and say well this is what I've downloaded and I'm like but you know you might have ten thousand dollars in the restaurant category and it's like okay did you actually go to the restaurants for ten thousand dollars that month or you know did you eat that much or is that actually travel and so we often kind of bounce that around a little bit and kind of put it in the proper categories um why why we're talking so much about budget and what we're doing and thanks steve yes we you know this is kind of part of our whole thing of budgeting is you need to know these numbers not only when you're in your 30s your 40s your 50s but also in your 60s 70s 80s because you know people often come to us and they're like hey you know like new clients this is this is the greatest question of new clients is hey you know i've heard from my buddy i just need 75 percent of what i make and i can do that for a retirement and i'm like okay well what do you make well i make this okay well, what do you spend i don't know i'm like hmm you know so would 75 percent work for you like does that work for you in retirement well i don't know how much is that and it's like you need to know those numbers and that's the value that really someone like you know myself and kelly and jeff bring to the team of the tower group to make sure that people really know these numbers because these numbers i've often heard too like we even had a client that we took golfing um and you know we're talking all about retirement and what he's doing for retirement and how it's all working and then he goes yeah you know my buddy my buddy said he's taken like $120,000 a year and that's totally working for him. And, you know, he's he's really got that dialed down. And, you know, I think that'll be good for me. And both me and Kelly kind of looked at each other and we were like, well, does it work for you? Because, you know, like when we look at his company stuff, he has a couple companies and you kind of go, he's spending a lot more than $120,000 a year now. And that's, you know, we got introduced to another client and we always hate telling this story, but we got introduced to another person 
And we actually couldn't even engage with him because, you know, he was vice president of an oil company, spent $300,000 a year. And he's like, wow, who needs $300,000 a year? If I retire, I'm not going to spend that. Hell, nobody's going to spend that. And it was like this old cowboy. I'm not going to spend that. The first year he was retired, he spent $280,000, came back to us and went, okay, well, you know, I have a couple million bucks. It shouldn't be a big deal. But what a lot of people don't think about is that $210,000 after tax was $420,000, which then the next year he did $200,000, which another $400,000. How long do you think those couple million lasted? After three years, he was like, my whole account's almost gone. Then the markets dropped in 2008 and he was grumpy and kept coming back to us. I need help with this. I need help with this. And it's like, we couldn't you know, direct our attention towards that because of the fact that if you're not willing to take accountability yourself, it's really big for us that you need to know those numbers. You need to know what right. that amount is because all of a sudden, if you burn through a million bucks, yeah, you're back at work and he's back at work now. And I've seen him a couple of times and he's still working and he's like, wow, I have no idea. That's how I burn through this money. And I think that's that, the challenge for everybody. That person is in denial but not realizing that they're in denial and what i mean by that is that he's in denial that he knows his number he's in denial that he knows how he should spend the money um, to get the max joy for him right so that's what's interesting is is left to our own devices we could probably all see it's like okay well the people around me my inner circle and the, and who i relate with sometimes might influence your spending patterns tell me that, that you don't have a friend that has a property or a vacation property in bc or phoenix and then you think you know it's it's human nature to say well should i should i have that property maybe but that's where we can help you say, okay, what's right for you? Because you know, I'm I'm nerdy in a few different areas uh, of my life, and that's who you want on your team, right? You want nerdy, passionate people on some of these topics that maybe give you hives. Like I like to seek optimal numbers in terms of saying, okay, well, are you spending your minimally acceptable today? that you really define as an amazing lifestyle that you just love, you're getting the max joy out of where you're spending, great. You know, so then maybe let's continue that topic of conversation and the habits that we're kind of assuming are, are common um, is we're gonna save, we're gonna automate our savings, we're gonna apply that over there too. So that's what knowing your minimally acceptable lifestyle will yield. Then we'll save a bunch and if uh, we, we've done this for a number of people where it's like, okay, you want to make work optional. You want to stop work 15 years from now. If we change this and change this, just in terms of better understanding of spending awareness, you might be able to stop work three years earlier. Okay, great. There, there isn't much I need to change and sacrifice, but it certainly isn't things like, oh, I'm going to plan on spending 75% of what I made those benchmark numbers that are floated out there make no sense what you need to do to seek optimality in this area is to change your perspective and say okay i want to choose my lifestyle level and then we'll work from there that'll be the foundation of the plan and if we if pam and i go back regularly and test it and find improvements then i think everybody will like we're not perfect and we're not speaking to you from that position we have some luxuries in our, our lives and conscious choices. We've most made mistakes in the past. Like it's it's all human nature there, but we continually improve how much joy we get out of our lifestyle spend in that year. And what we're talking about here, Pam, and what's on the slide, again, we're talking about it at length, but that's just because it's that critical. Common sense isn't common practice. And what well, you're talking so about, what, what you're talking about is looking backwards as to where I spent. What we want to do is look, instead of through the rear view mirror, we want to look through the windshield and say, okay, in an exciting way, what am I going to spend in the future? And I think as you get more and more, um, you get better at this or, or, you know, more and more aware of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, 
COVID's been really interesting for people because, you know, I've had a lot of people who were living the life and, you know, they had new cars all the time and they had, they, they were buying stuff. And it was funny because, you know, if you talk to them before COVID happened, it's like, oh, you know, we want to enjoy our lives. Life's too short. People are dying of cancer all the time. We want to enjoy it. So it comes down to, again, the denialers a little bit because they do want to live the life and they're having fun and they're making money. But stuff happens in life. And, you know, now they're kind of going, oh, you know, might be unemployed, you might be unhealthy, you might have things happening to your life. And all of a sudden, it's like, it's a time to get real about some of this stuff. And that's where, you know, COVID people are like at home going, I didn't need a lot of that stuff. I didn't need to do this stuff. I didn't need to buy this stuff now. And some people are enjoying being at home and other people I talk to are really unhappy and really just want to get back to life and get back to normal. You know, even for me, you know, I kind of do one of these when someone starts talking about the new normal because I'm like, oh, new normal, don't like this new normal. It's kind of like after my back surgery and the surgeon kept telling me that's my new normal. I was like, no, oh, I don't want that new normal. You know, that's the reality of what's happening here is, is getting to really define what is something that you really need, something that you really want. You know, it comes down to, again, tracking that money that you, you spend each month. And like Kelly was talking about my deck, you know, I'm one of those ones that's financial planner. So even when I did my deck, you know, I got two realtors that we deal with in our company um, to come out and tell me what this deck plan would get me back if I sold my house. And, you know, at the time they both said, well, you know, it'll give you about 10 grand, maybe 14 if you do this gardening thing and you do this, and maybe we'll give you that if you sold your house. I was never intending on selling my house. But as many of you know, building a deck and doing a garden is a whole lot more than $14,000. So it's like you weigh it out and go, am I going to enjoy it that much more? During COVID, you know, I'm sitting gardening when I have extra time after work instead of going out. Yeah, I'm enjoying it even more. So then it's like, Sometimes the money you spend isn't going to be money back in your pocket, but it's going to be enjoyment money that you kind of go, I love that. I love the fact about it and I'm willing to spend the money on it. You just got to make sure that you can afford to spend the money on it and say, you know, is that really what I want? I've had some people this week ask me, you know, maybe I should just get a lake home because then it's going to be like a travel home every year. And I've calculated my travel budgets an extra $20,000 a year. You know, I can probably afford to now buck up for a million five or $2 million home on a lake because I'm not gonna have that travel budget anymore. I'm not gonna travel anywhere. And it's like, how realistic is it that you are gonna travel nowhere when you're someone who traveled everywhere and now you're kind of going, okay, COVID times you're bored and you're kind of saying, okay, you might have that home for a little while, but okay, now you've got a $2 million home that yes, will probably cost you $2,000 more a month in mortgage but then it's like people aren't calculating in what additional expenses are you going to have for utilities? How about your property tax that now probably has jumped another 10 grand? It's like, are you factoring in that $50,000 a year instead of just the $20,000 you're doing? We can help with all of that. Like that's where we can look at a scenario. Like we have many people that upgrade their home and we say, okay, well, if, if you do a, a, a major reno, what are the comparables in your area? What is that scope of rental? Or maybe you switch to another property. We can help if you know what today's lifestyle is with a really high degree of awareness. And if you don't, as a reminder, we can help you take some actual uh, spending statements and we've got a process to help you. But if you know what you spend today and then we can look at that next scenario, absolutely, that's the right call for many people. Um, and, and maybe that's a really good store of value sometimes is a, an intelligent reno or a change in property. Um, so it's just, you know, I would encourage you to ask us or come back or request more help in certain topics. Um, and then we can help you kind of, again, uh, apply more impact for your spending and to, to your quality of lifestyle. Like this forced, this forced pause um, at home has really been, we're, tr we're continuing to try to find the opportunities there. And there's a, a huge amount where it's even a, allowed us to test test our lifestyle and say, well, can I, can I ratchet it down and still have the same quality of lifestyle? Yeah. And I think like 
we've often said like you've you've seen probably some shows um gail van oxlade used to run some great shows at the time from winnipeg um take out the money you spend in each month in each category in cash especially the ones that you have problems with um like for me and kelly can kind of talk about his challenges is you know for me i would go to costco and you know we were having that conversation with a client two days ago also golfing and he's like oh you know i went to costco the other day and it's 400 bucks every time i go and it's 400 bucks and 400 bucks but it's nice to go up and down the aisles and he said he was so stressed out with everybody in their masks and i know that feeling myself because i feel rather stressed out by it too um you got you kind of go into a store and you get what you need and you get out and it's amazing what that bill is when you get in and get what you need to get out. <laughs> because, you know, I was a Costco person. That was my biggest challenge is I would go into Costco and spend $360. And as hard as I tried, I could get it down to $320. But I noticed I threw out a lot of groceries. I threw out a lot of stuff that I was like, wow, I didn't need that. But at the time you felt like you needed it. So I started going to Costco, taking an envelope of cash of $300 and i'd start saying okay i gotta get down from 360 or 380 to 320 i'm gonna get down to 300 and then i'm gonna get down to 250 and then i found i wasn't getting some of the things that i still needed and i was like you know what i need to just get what i need and i'm gonna go and i'm not gonna get a cart and i'm gonna carry whatever i can in my hands and i'm going to go to costco and just get what i can carry in my hands no cart and I'm gonna get out. And that bill usually was less than a hundred bucks every single time. And you know, that kind of curbed, it took me almost every trip to Costco for seven months to do that, to curb my Costco habit. And I'll go and I'll look around Costco occasionally when you know life was a little bit different and you could spend time just looking at stuff, but I wouldn't buy it anymore. And I think again, it's just that 21 days to starting a new habit is you got to do it enough times to kind of go, okay, you don't need that stuff, just stop. When a few other examples that we've got is um, a household might take out $300 every two weeks as an ent entertainment budget. And then you've got that cash and you're choosing where that goes. So it's not every concert and hockey game and whatever else that sometimes can be expensive. It's like, okay, well, this fine dining, maybe that's entertainment. Maybe now let's go and, you know, take a walk through a park or drive out to like Kananaskis or Bragg Creek as part of the entertainment because now our entertainment budgets are lower. Or maybe $600 a month is too little. We're going to increase it to $800 a month. So it's more just about, you know, like you said, Pam, if there's certain categories that you want to work on, it's how do we make that fun, right? Like for myself, I get a lot of joy from my golf collection. So now I'm, I'm at the point where there's nothing that gets added to that golf collection in, unless something else leaves. So with that little pool of cash or capital, it's fun to kind of exchange a few things. So um, those are also, you know, just good ways to look at categories that might be troublesome or that you you can actually control because some of the stuff you can't control and that's where it's um not appropriate to uh, you know achieve regret and stress from spending if the refrigerator refrigerator breaks and we need a new one that's kind of an uncontrollable expense and hopefully we've got the adequate savings there um, but then that's where you want to focus on what categories, and usually there's only four or five or maximum six, what categories are actually in your control? And then having a plan, and maybe, like you said, maybe, maybe Pam, like focusing on one for 21 days or a month, right? And then looking at another one, another uh, category in, the, in a future month. Yeah, because this sounds so easy to do in practice, and it is so hard. It is probably the hardest thing that people have to do. And, you know, we have with some clients a wine bucket, but again, we'll go into some of that. Um, I know right now it's super hard to obviously spend anything in cash with COVID because that's actually changed things. So people are like, well, how about my credit cards? And, you know, something that I do with my credit cards, so we'll kind of go on with this is, is I always say never spend more than $200 without a cooling off period. Cooling off period is actually a legal term where you usually have somewhere from 10 days to 30 month, 30 days to have a cool off period for a decision that you've made, whether or not you want to go through with it. And that's why is that, things like, is that oh, because there's uh, emotions with money or why is that? <laughs> exactly. So oftentimes the stuff you buy, it's stuff. So stuff, when you're doing that, you kind of go, 
are you really buying it because you need it? Um, like a new fridge, like Kelly was talking about, obviously if your fridge quits, you need a new fridge. You're going to spend more than $200. Um, that's something that you obviously need versus your wants. And, you know, in our kids' classes, it was even interesting to hear some of our kids' stuff and the kids would tell on their parents and go, oh, you know, my mom buys on Amazon all day long and she buys all kinds of stuff she doesn't need. And then she grumbles about it a month later that she didn't need any of that stuff. And of course, those parents are clients of ours. So we went back and said, you know, are you actually doing that? Because like, let's sit down and figure that out. And they were like, wow, I am. It's brutal that my kid just called me out on that. <laughs> so, but, you know, it comes down to needs versus wants. Do you really need it or do you just want it? And it just looks really interesting. Or you might be having a bad day, a bad day, especially for women. Women tend to either eat, go get their hair done, buy shoes or, you know, buy stuff online. Um, men get a little more excited about, well, the hottest, you know, gadget, technology, TVs, golf stuff, sporting stuff. Um, that tends to be the exciting, you know, latest, greatest too, that you kind of saw in those videos. And it's like really narrow that down and say, you know, is that congruent with my goal? As I just said, I needed X amount for something else. And it's like, are you using that X amount out of this savings account that you're doing? Or what are yeah. you doing? And then it also becomes a way of trimming the budget. You know, yeah, and retail, retail therapy is is a thing, right? Like it does exist. You know, it's fun to buy stuff. Awesome. So then maybe when you want to go down that method or that role and it's like, okay, well, I, you know, I want to go and you know, I've got some time. I think it would be fun to go do some shopping. It's like, okay, well, what planned shopping sprees are needed? Okay, well, I was going to spend $350 anyways in this category um, because it's the season for that sport or it's um, every six months I, I allow myself this many dollars for clothes or whatever. So it's great. Then just make it that planned shopping spree for that thing. And, and oh, and one, one, other, one other, sorry, one other uh, example that I had that many clients tell me about this is, is that they find themselves continually updating and, and doing their home um, changes, uh, design, decor, that type of thing. It's amazing what if you just switch the furniture, maybe, you know, buy one picture or switch a picture or have a party, kind of an internal garage sale where you're changing some of the um, accents in your home or the artwork amongst a group of um, multiple families all of a sudden you don't have to spend that two grand a year and you might have that as kind of like your weakness but don't be denial in denial we all have kind of weakness areas where we are spending can get out of out of control yep so obviously the next one just because again we can't spend with cash right now so the biggest questions that we tend to get is credit cards especially like air miles people are like well should i put everything on my credit card because i can get air air mile points especially right now you're not traveling you're not using those air mile points there's a lot of questions into the credit card companies as to whether or not they're extending those points which they are um i haven't seen any that are not so just in case you guys have that question in the back of your mind but this becomes the biggest problem for people and people tend to shift. We've seen people who have shifted all their utilities to their credit cards. They've shifted their cell phones, their corporate, anything corporate expense, they're going to put on their credit card as much as they can and then keep the rest in cash. But if you can't pay that off each month, don't use them. And, and we say that multiple times because people can get so easily out of control with credit cards that this becomes public enemy number one. Um, you know, you're just not conscious of your spending and people laugh at me. I know my girlfriend, Tracy, she's not on this call, but, uh, she, uh, laughs at me all the time because I'll say to her, well, I only have a hundred dollar budget for this. And she's like, it's $115. Just get it. You can afford the money. And I'm like, no, my budget's a hundred bucks. I can't get it. And, you know, she laughs or I'll say, you know, I've already gone to a movie four times this month. I'm not going again. And you know as soon as you get conscious about where you actually are spending your money you might think that's stupid but if you can get really conscious about where you spend you don't overspend in those categories anymore because it's harder to let go of that money and like for me i won't let go of that money anymore because it's like i might have this goal and this goal and this goal where it's like i need to put money though into those pools i can't do it on my card 
and so try to use the same budget so if you know like for me every year i spend about 550 and i budget 600 for all my gardening plants getting you know weed man out or getting a tree service out i budget 600 bucks and so if a company comes along and says well gee you want this don't you or you want to i'm like oh i've spent my 600 dollars and I know what my tree budget is. And even lately, you know, I lost a Mayday tree. And I said to the tree people, I said, no, I, you know, like, they're like, it's $500 to take it down. You're gonna have to call a landscape company to get another one put up. I'm like, okay, well, I'll just wait for it to die or I'll try to cut it back myself. I'm not spending five, $600 on the tree to take it down. Cause then that's my whole flower budget and everything else. So, you know, I can afford to do that if I wanted to. And a lot of people just go, ah, I can afford to do it. So I'm gonna do it. And that becomes an issue too for people is, you know, they just can, so they will. And you can't do that because it's like, then you really don't know what you spend continually and constantly and consciously. If there's things that come up and there's going to be things that come up, we want to track that in so that it's like, okay, you know what, we have a fridge coming or we have a roof coming. And again, it comes down to that's the same reason why condos have reserve funds is to say, you know, here are all the things that are going to come up that need maintenance. We try to get our clients to start doing that, especially closer to retirement is what are you going to spend on that house? What are you going to spend on the retirement? What do we need to know for big purchases? And Kelly always has on his spreadsheet that annual uh, spreadsheet, which you can talk a bit more about, Kelly. Yeah, it's just like, it's interesting to say, okay, burn rate per month. Okay, I know that. Um, but then the stuff that's irregular or semi-annual or annual stuff throughout the year, um, that's where you can maybe make that more planned, whether it's a shopping spree or maybe a lot of people successfully say, okay, well, I know it's about seven grand or 7,200. Okay, well, great. Let's pre-authorize $600 into a specific savings plan. And then if we know that we've got a big purchase or a big buy coming up or something like property tax or annual insurances we kind of have those funds kind of held away so it can be more of a system that you put in place but really like you said pam with your your garden and whatnot and big expenses that happen track those oh okay every march i'm going to have about this you know coming on this category and then over time you just get that much more dialed in because again one way to also be um, wealthy and in control of your money is to spend less so if you can spend consciously and have the same lifestyle but you've spent less maybe that means more in other categories or maybe that means um, stopping work that much earlier and so again we come back to you know if you're not using those cards put them away for emergencies again right now very difficult to do but a lot of our clients who are having trouble with cards and spending on them we say just put them away or you know fill up a bowl like people who are having serious issues with credit cards um fill up a bowl in your freezer and put the credit card in and put a bowl of water in your freezer with your credit card leave it there and if you actually need your credit card for something it'll take you about two days three days to defrost that bowl of ice <laughs> believe it or not um some people think they can do it in a day it's often not the case um but then that way you can then use that card it still works in a bowl of ice you know so you know at the end of the day that's the best way to get it out of your hands or just cut it up um and then calculate too a lot of people have had a lot of fraud with online purchases and they have multiple cards that they constantly use for online purchases definitely as any financial planner would tell you and any banker probably would tell you at this point in time in life use one card for online purchases and use that card only for online purchases the rcmp are now tracking a lot of the fraud purchases and that is an easy way for them to find out where because if you've only shopped at four places and then all of a sudden your cards fraudulated they can find that pretty quick now when you actually can say to them that's the only card i use and these are the four places i went um you know that's that's a pretty great thing and i often say like if you're someone who shops for online clothes or you're someone who shops for online you know shoes or amazon things it's like figure out what that money is every month and make that amount your limit so for me i've done that and i've kind of said okay you know what i spend per month um two thousand dollars let's say on my credit card online my limit 
is $2,000 on that card. I don't have a $20,000 limit, even though they've offered me that and I've taken it away. And every month I call in or I do anything on that card, they're like, well, we give you a bigger limit. And it's like, I'm sure you can, but that's my online credit card and I only want it for $2,000. That limits your amount of fraud. It also limits the amount that, that you actually will also spend on it online to be stupid. And then, you know, that also gives you a better chance of having a su successful retirement, successful spending, and everything going on from that. So going into how Kelly and I were just talking about the different buckets of money, these tend to be the best buckets of money that you would, should always have. So we often say emergency expenses, you know, emergency expenses are going to be health, they're going to be um, I lost my job. It's going to be things like COVID. Um, you always, by practice, should have a minimum of three months of your salary in your bank account to use immediately, not to invest, not to do anything, just have it available. A lot of people go, well, I have a line of credit that works. That's not money. So that just becomes debt. And that becomes if you're laid off, you can't pay it. So that's not that's not an emergency fund sure it's an availability to cash and we always want to have an availability to cash when you don't need it because of course when you do need it it's hard to get so but people get sick people have things that happen to them and it's like at the end of the day you always want to have an emergency fund and for any kind of health expenses let's say someone has a terminal illness or they have something that could be a long-term chronic illness it's like you want to calculate in what that care is going to be worth. You want to calculate in what that med medical medication can be worth too. Um, some of your medical expenses, rehab, that type of stuff all into this. Because, of course, this becomes something that the only person that can earn an income is you. So if you don't have disability insurance or you don't have critical illness insurance, this is where disability and critical illness play a key role as well as, you know, your critical illness insurance and your disability aren't going to pay for you to go to physio every month and get, you know, massages every month at $2,000 a month if you need that. So that's where, again, you want to target that pretty closely and say, you know, do I have this here to fund it or do I need to put that in here? Because you always want to take care of you first. Pets are another big one because, of course, everybody who has a pet, I've got a pet, and, you know, you, you spend too much money on them. You always spend way too much money on them. You know, I always look at my dog costs me $115 of PetSmart to get his hair cut. I usually buy him two bags of treats, and I always budget in $130 for that trip. His food costs me another $100 a month. And so it's like, I kind of look at my dog budget and it's like, here's my dog budget. I might need a couple extra things for him. So now I'm going to put in an extra, you know, $50, $60. That is my pet budget because otherwise I go to the store and I'm like, oh, isn't that cute? I'm going to buy him this and I'm going to buy him that toy. It's so easy with pets that people get way out of control. And you could talk about that, Kelly. Yeah, like I think my addition to this is that everybody um, might have similar and maybe a few additional categories, but choose your buckets, choose what's in your control and then just make us make it conscious. And one very impactful thing is um, you, know, you have it there, uh, the, the no bitch money, you know, it's also the fun money. But like if there's you know, the two members of your household or more. It, you don't necessarily want to question everybody on all the transactions and the, the escape route for that is to have a certain amount per week or per month or every two weeks and you stockpile your own funds for just stuff that you choose for your control that really isn't in question and that that has yielded a lot of smoother communication for some of the households that I've seen. And then the other, the other, the other I guess, um, maybe boring or serious application of these very valuable concepts is what if your income stops? So that would maybe is a disability or a major illness or like you just said, Pam, okay, now I'm temporarily laid off work. Okay, so then knowing your numbers gives you confidence or that reassurance. It's like, okay, well, I know my basic monthly burn rate. So for 20 different reasons, that's very valuable, that concept. So. Um, and, and a lot of this can be fun, right? You've got a fun money category or a travel category. You know, I think also a best practice might be having a big travel year and then a small travel year and then a big travel year. That seemed to work well for people or 
you you could allocate this year's travel and maybe next year it doesn't sound like there's much happening in that regard maybe that's when you do your home reno or maybe that's when you amp up your savings plan and say hey does that mean i can work six months less in my long-term career so you with these with these data points and if we're using actual real data we can do a lot for you and your plan and I think like always knowing that, and you know, I had a client that actually is on this session, so I'll use his property taxes as an example, is he always says to me, like, like when we're talking about September money, and he goes, you know, in September I've got these policies to pay, I've got my property tax of this, I need X. And that number is always that number, and he always knows that number. So again, being aware, being conscious, kind of knowing that number is so incredibly important. Like I can't even I can't even tell you that tends to be the exact number you want to know. Some people don't have their property taxes come out in tips. And it's like if you're finding that property tax number, especially now that it's going up so much, um, you know, know that number. And if you can't afford it annually, then get on tips. It doesn't cost you anything to do that monthly and start looking at that or start if the house is too expensive that you can't afford that monthly anymore, then maybe it's time to look at downsizing and it's so hard to do that for people as they as they get older because they fall in love with their homes and i think some of the smartest things people have done is said you know hey these expenses are getting too much for me and this is what's going to happen is i have to downsize to have enough for long enough and again you want to know what that long enough number is what does that number look like because you know i've I've met lots of people who are especially young and they have their own companies and it's like, well, I'm making great money. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Then all of a sudden illness happens and it's like their company value, like let's say you have big loans out to the bank. Well, all of a sudden you're not around and the bank starts going, oh, can they earn that money? They start calling in loans. Your company's not worth that value really quick. So, you know, we've had that happen to people where it's like, you know, they haven't planned for that. And we end up meeting them when they're at that circumstance. And, you know, someone says, wow, you need to go talk to the tower group. It's kind of too late to then, you know, well, if banks are calling in money, that's, you're at a rope. So like you just said, knowing your spend rate, knowing your save rate, like it puts you more in control and gives you more confidence. That's another benefit there. Um, you know, this isn't, hey, I looked at one, my bank statement and one of my credit cards last month for 10 minutes. I know what happens per for my mortgage and, you know, a couple other numbers. I know it. That's not it. Like this, the, you, only, you only get to the point of knowing your numbers by, you know, working on it over time, maybe having like a, you know, a 30-day test, you know, at least once a year. And it changes over time and making it a fun exercise where you're choosing consciously your lifestyle level and the fun stuff, um, that only happens over time. And, and so then that's something that it's important to kind of keep in mind. And if, if you get scared about it and you uh, de delay, deny, procrastinate, avoid, you're not going to get there, right? But it's so key. Like if you ever want to stop work ever, this is pretty key, you know, and, and so if you want to make the get the most joy out of your money and know and with like with less guilt on those major vacations, oh well, this shopping spree was planned or this trip was planned, it fits the financial plan, it fits the retirement forecast, and then you just have that much more joy from it. So there's a lot of benefits from this system. And I think what we're trying to do is kind of give you our awareness or our mindset or perspective as to how it all works together and why it's so important. That's one of the key values. But I just, you know, obviously we're over that hour mark. I guess we'll, we'll continue getting through the last few slides and get to the Q&A point too. Yep, and you know, we always say to people with a house, if you have a house, you should have a minimum, a, a house or a condo, you should have a minimum of 500 bucks a month that goes towards house expenses. Really, most people we say you should actually put away a thousand dollars and people kind of look at you and go like this. That's what a house costs you in maintenance usually like over time and when you add it up it's shocking how that actually costs you that and same thing with condo you know a lot of people have had condo calls on money um that's why you always want to have that there and then like kelly was saying about the no bitch money we often say to people like if you've got joint expenses have it as joint expenses in a joint account then anything that's kind of hey you guys got fun money you want to do certain things that goes into a different bucket same with travel but your no bitch money 
I always say is, and you know, why we call it no bitch is because you can't bitch at each other for it. So, you know, if you've got $500 saved up and you decide to buy a pair of Jimmy Choo shoes and the husband goes, that's a complete waste of money. It doesn't matter. That's, that's, you can't say anything because now if you've got 500 bucks, you can go buy the TV that you want or the golf club that you want or whatever you want to do. That's your no bitch money where people have trouble talking about budgets evenly like this because they're like, well, we start fighting. That's what you fight over. So if you can just separate that out and say, here's joint, here's travel, here's these things that we have to do, but here's your accounts that just are your money. So if you're a good little saver and you want to save up a thousand bucks and go do something really great and that person's jealous of it, too bad. You should have saved up your money instead of spending it on dumb things too. But you can't bitch about it. And we often say to people like, get that emotion out of there because that's actually what saves a lot of relationships. And of course, I put this slide last. And why I put it last is because we often meet a lot of people who put this last. So that's why I put it last. You should always pay yourself first. So number one, that is the number one thing that everyone should do is set up a savings account for yourself. Have that three months of emergency savings there. We usually like to say five, but if you can, you know, you're not there, then let's get that three months set up so that you have that three months there. Set up a non-registered TFSA, bucket your money into different categories, know that number. So that's that category. And if you kind of go, well, you know, some months it's three, some months it's six. No, every month it should be consistent. And if you had to wait a month, it's probably not going to kill you. So that's something to know too. Um, contribute monthly to your RSPs, contribute money to kids' plans like RESPs. Um, that way too, you're always collecting the market up and downs because I know a lot of people, you know, wait, well, I'm going to see what I'm going to pay myself in a bonus, you know, or I'm going to see what I'm going to get as a dividend out of my company, or I'm going to see and I'm going to do it as one big lump sum. It's great to do, but as you guys have many, many of you have seen, we don't always invest it right away or we'll put it into different categories because sometimes that's also the highest point in the markets. So it tends to be the worst time to probably invest and people who kind of do that monthly or they give money early or summer, we usually start bugging people for that type of stuff. Um, not only because people actually spend more money in the summer and then that way it gets it out of your hands, which has also become a great tool for us, but it's also um, a great time to really look at the markets because people are forgetting about the markets. So the markets tend to, that's why there's like, you might have heard of the term buy in Maine, go away. Um, that usually is why the markets this year are very different, very volatile. And I think with volatility, as you can contribute regularly, you, you even out that volatility quite a bit. When I would add, um, a lot of people agree with this. They've heard of this. Uh, pay yourself first. Yeah, pay myself first. Yeah, I deserve it. But do you do it? <laughs> so well, we often, we often hear the deserving it. You, do you want to talk about that, Kelly, the deserving it? I deserve it. Yeah, and it may not be yeah. my account. It might be the Audi that I want to buy or the watch that I want to have. Or So so what, what I think about that is like, do you do it? Can we do it better? Can we pay you first? So if your lifestyle level is $6,000 and your household makes $8,000, well, test it pre-authorize the $2,000 that isn't pre-authorized already then. Everybody's got that surplus that kind of just accumulates. Okay, well, increase your pre-authorization, test it and say, okay, well, next month, okay, well, no, that wasn't my actual burn rate or now it's in kind of encroaching into those big buys or annual expenses. Great, you might need to grab four grand back to you know, have a big lump sum that was planned. So. Yeah, and a lot of people we hear is, um, you know, I, I work hard or I've worked long, you know, I'm, you know, I'm older, I deserve this. It's like, well, it's not necessarily what you deserve. Like no one's really going to give you, you know, a, a bonus or an entitled gift in a way, right? You have to just consciously, consciously choose, you know, what surplus you have and how it's applied, right? So then some people just love vehicles and that's where that, that spend, like uh, there's all many people that we know that have that and you know fine let's consciously allocate that but then if you have a new vehicle every second year no problem but we can help you say okay that might mean an extra four years of on your working career so can help you trade off and balance that for sure and then of course comes down to our last video what are you teaching your kids so this is quick setup you have down here yeah 
mom and dad just got it redone and they said this was our space so we really tried to make it comfortable amanda took care of the decorating with mom and i took care of the setup with dad you know we got all the gadgets we need we have the hdtv system and we got the new tv how big is the tv it's only 60 inches it would have been great if dad could have sprung for the 70 inch because i mean eddie already had that like a year ago but i guess we're kind of catching up now you just had friends over to watch movies this morning oh yeah yeah now that we got this it's not as embarrassing because before let's be honest it was a little embarrassing i mean my daughter all our friends would come over and i don't know we just don't want to be the running jokes like i mean 60 inches <laughs> yeah you guys have a good time in the caribbean it was okay it's just that a lot of the stores there you can't really get the good designer stuff you can get down here and apparently my suitcase was too big there's always something to have. There's there's a reason why technology evolved, so you can have the best thing to help your life, you know, complement your lifestyle. Question. Do you buy happiness? Yeah, I'd like to think so. I mean, anybody who says you can't buy happiness is clearly shopping at the wrong place. Oh. So, you know, this is what we've seen in our practice is that if you teach your kids that, kids learn by experience. You know, sociology studies class and over the last little while people are like, get rid of class, get rid of things, but often kids get trapped in the same patterns that you did. There's just more pressures today because kids really have the opportunity to get everything. Um, you know, teach kids early on money lessons, like saving for themselves first, you know, giving to charities, you know, being generous. Um, learning how to spend money. We often say with kids, teach them how to go to the malls. You know, one of the best things that my parents would do is they'd give me a list of all the stuff that I needed and give me money and say, you can get everything you need. You can buy yourself stuff for back to school clothes, but you have to get yourself underwear or boots or this or that. And I still to this day take out that same amount of money and I get myself what I need when I go to the mall. And so it's something that you kind of ingrain early on and you'll continue that through life. And then you tend not to buy other stupid things that you really need because you've learned how to practice it. Um, obviously, we've set up a set of uh, classes, which many of you on this call have, have had your kids go through. Um, people have had nothing but, you know, they've ranted and raved about these classes that we've done with our wealth creation classes for kids and young adults, and we have them win gift cards and all kinds of things. We might actually pull that online now that COVID's going to change things so that more kids can attend online. But of course, teaching your kids early habits, it's interesting how how engaged all of these clients' kids became into this. And, you know, they were telling their parents and they're like, oh my God, you know, my kids were almost nauseating after your class. But, you know, I, I think they've taught their parents things too. And I think that that's just amazing to have go through what happens in life. So, you know, just be aware of what you're doing and, and go through from there. And Kelly, you can finish it off. Yeah, thank you everybody for attending and, and your patience and conversation. We look forward to continuing this dialogue. Um, I really, you know, this, this phrase really resonates with me, is that the key to having it all, because that's what a lot of people want, is one at all. The key to having it all is, is knowing that you already do. So how do we just become more grateful for what we do have? And, and you know, I, I love this, you know, time at home from the angle of testing how do now we re rebuild our lifestyles to say, okay, let's spend consciously and have a, you know, at least a good a lifestyle or better, maybe for fewer dollars. And then, you know, leap forward at your next lifestyle level, you know, when you're financially independent or work is optional, do you continue to work or do you change your career? Um, maybe that's a different lifestyle level. So it's just really interesting conversation and it really gives us a lot of uh, ability to help you get what you want out of life. So we look forward to a future conversation. And again, if you have any questions, please put them in the question uh, category or chat and we can chat about your individual questions that you may have. We'll wait a couple more minutes or a minute here to see if anyone else enters any questions in. 
and otherwise everyone can have a wonderful day and hopefully we've given you some value on that and again really um you know concentrate on this because it's important not only from your lifestyle today but it's also for your retirement tomorrow so you know exactly what that number is for retirement and so that we can plan and if you want to do other things through retirement we can actually plan for that because we know the number and that's something that obviously we can help you with at the tower group anytime thanks again yeah. for attending everybody thanks. bye